بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I do hope everyone's doing well. So, inshallah, as um, Sister Saba introduced, we are um, going to be carrying on with the topic of salah. And uh, this session, we're going to be, um, if I go to the structure, so we're going to be going through the obligatory, the compulsory acts of salah, and then the sunnah acts of salah. Um, and also um, the actions and what we read in Salah. So the way that I've um, structured it is that I've put in, so when I will mention certain acts with that, I will um, try my best to mention uh, what we read in those, in those um, when, we, when we are doing those acts as well, rather than mentioning what we read all separately um, and then all the actions separately, I've tried to make it um, more connected. Um, the obligatory acts of the compulsory acts of Salah essentially means that if you um, do not complete these acts or if you do not do these acts and your Salah is incomplete, it's not it's not completed, and it's invalid. Um, the Sunnah acts of Salah, essentially, it's what the Prophet, peace be upon him, would do and he would practice in his prayer. Um, and if he, um, you know, it's, it's not something that is compulsory to do or, you know, it's uh, but if you it was something that he used to regularly do in his prayer. So that's how, um, inshallah, the difference between the two. And before I begin, I also wanted to um, uh, just to, the like the word arkan of salah means, you know, the components or the parts of salah. So I wanted to just go through just a very, very, um, you know, like almost like a bird's eye view um, of salah. So before we get into the obligatory and the sunnah, we have this um overview of how you know the salah is structured so we have the um and i've actually put this in pictures as well so let me go to the next oh this is this is the one so this is like the i've put the main like six components in um you know in pictures so the first one um, as you can see the person on the left um is he's raising his hands and he's doing takbir so that's an, uh, a, a component of salah and then the standing so when you stand and you recite um verses from the quran and then when you bow down, and then when you do prostration, and when you sit at the end, and then also if you're praying um, four, four rakahs, then you will sit in the middle as well. And then this is saying salam. So when you raise your hands at the beginning, that enters you into the prayer and you start praying. Um, and then when you say salam at the end, um, that means that your prayer is finished and you have uh, finished salam. Um, and another point I wanted to cover before I start into um, Salah is this, uh, what is one rakah? Because I will probably be mentioning this many, many, many times. Um, and I want it to be um, a bit more clearer that what I mean by a rakah. Um, so essentially, all our prayers, so Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, all the com they, they all have um, certain, they have certain rakah that are compulsory in them. So for Fajr, there's two compulsory rakats. So um, and then Zohar has four. So there's all of them have different. Asr has four as well. Maghrib has three. Isha has four. So if we take the example of Fajr, um, because it has two, it's the one of the sh uh, shortest ones. So one rakat. So Fajr has two rakats. Yeah. Um, so if we take the example of what is one rakat. So one rakat essentially is when one person, when he starts his standing from the standing position um uh, so when you when you raise your hands and you start your prayer so from the standing position you go down into your when you've prayed when you recited your um, surah fatiha and another surah from the quran you go down into um bowing and then when you go into prostration and then after prostration when you stand up again that means that you've completed one rakah and then you've entered into your second rakah and then you would repeat this entire uh, cycle again but you would sit at the end as well and then do salam um, so I hope that's clear I mean by all means inshallah you can ask questions in the chat if anything comes up as I go go along um, and I'll inshallah try my best to clarify things um, so when I refer to regard this is what essentially I mean is that from that standing when you go into bowing prostration and then you stand up again so that's one completion of a there's a completion of one regard um, so now we will start off with the obligatory acts of Salah. Um, there's um, uh, uh, 11 of these listed. I mean, some of the points when I actually go through them one by one, I've joined a few together um, as well um, in relation to the 
the narration that comes up according to it or the prophetic saying or the Quranic verse um, that is related to it. So the first one is intention. <coughs> so this is an obligatory act of prayer to have an intention. So it doesn't necessarily mean a, a verbal intention. Um, this can be intention made in your, you know, in your heart. Um, and you know, um, essentially, you should know what, how many, uh, what units you are praying. So how many rakka you are praying, and also what prayer you're praying. Um, and it's on this famous uh, hadith um, that in the malamalu binniyat actions are according to your intentions. So before you stand up, so let's say you're going to stand up for asr prayer, you should know that you intend to pray asr. You should know that you intend to pray four rakka uh, first, whichever you know if you're praying the. Uh, the sunnah rakat first or the first however but you should know exactly what you're praying and it shouldn't be something that you intend in the middle of your prayer um the oh like you know in the middle you remember to make the intention that i'm praying this um so this is something that you should just you know it should be made in your heart it should be intended and you should know that this is what you're um, going to pray the second and third obligatory act is the opening the view so initially when you raise your hands at the beginning as you saw in the picture, when the person, when he raises his hands to his ears, um, and it's um, that is the opening takbir. And then also when you say salam at the end, when you when you turn your head um, 90 degrees to your right and then uh, 90 degrees to your left, that's saying salam at the end. Um, that's the, both of these acts are compulsory as well. And the, uh, there's a uh, hadith that the, the Prophet says that you, it puts you in a viable, in the, in the state of prayer, what puts you in the state of prayer is the takbir. So when you raise your hands, that means you're praying and you're in that state of prayer. And the salam at the end is what releases you from it. And that means your prayer has finished. So even we know, for instance, if we are watching someone praying, um, and it's often sometimes, you know, you need to go past someone and they're praying. Um, so you look for them to, have they done their salam? As soon as they've done their salam, you can go past them. Um, so, you know, it's not to walk in front of someone who's praying. Um and then another uh, companion, he narrates that he saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, he saw him making uh, salam on his right side and on his left side until he he could actually see the whiteness of his cheeks. So if you're sitting behind someone, you can see their, their cheek visibly when they turn their head to do salam. Um, so these are the second and third um, uh, obligatory acts of salah. Um, and also standing. So standing is an obligatory part of um, salah as well. Uh, because of this verse in the Quran that Allah says, um, the Hafiz wa salat al wa salat al wa lillahi qanitin. So take care of all the prayers and the middle prayer and stand before Allah in total devotion. So this stand is um, the key here in that it's um, uh, you know it's uh, obligatory and compulsory to stand. Um, and a companion he had a he had a question. He asked the Prophet peace be upon him. Um, you know, he had a physical problem and he said that I, you know, what if I can't pray standing? So the Prophet peace be upon him said that it, pray standing if you are able, if uh, pray standing, if you are able to, if you're not able to, then pray sitting. If you're not able to pray sitting, then pray whilst lying on your side. So we do have these, um, uh, you know, options that we can take um, in, you know, if we can, if we're not physically able to stand, then we can pray uh, sitting down. If we're not, if you're not able to sit down, then we can pray lying down on our sides. And also, uh, there's another hadith, uh, a narration by the Prophet peace be upon him that if, if a slave of Allah, if, if he is sick and he and he does, um, you know, so if you're not able to pray the way standing, um, and so he, the Prophet peace be upon him says he will feel get a, he will get a reward for those acts similar to what he would if he was healthy. So if you are able to, um, you know, so if you have to sit down, um, you know, we um, pray to Allah that we, we get the similar reward to if as if we were praying standing. So it doesn't mean that if someone is praying sitting down or lying down because they're not able to, that they will be, their prayer will have less reward than a person who's praying standing. Um, this is just something that's, um, you know, it's, it's there as an option to make it easier for people who are not able to stand for long periods of time. And we often see this in the, uh, you know, in the masjid as well, if you've, if you've been for Tarawi and prayers are a lot longer, um, that people do, they, you know, they do have chairs behind them and they sit down. Um, and this is, um, you know, it's up to each and every individual to assess if they, how long, you know, if they can stand for that long or if they can't, they need to sit down. Um, and so this is standing during the obligatory prayers. Um, now, the next one is reciting Surah Fatiha in every waka. 
So in every single rakat, so as I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, every prayer has different amounts of different rakats. Um, so in every single one of these rakats, you will pray Surah Fatiha. And that's something which is, um, you know, not, um, there's, there's no debate over this. It's something which is there's a c consensus on this. Um, and also, um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that whoever prays a prayer and he does not recite the opening chapter of the Quran, he has not prayed correctly, and that is Surah Fatiha. So it's a, it's a very, very important uh, part um, of praying, uh, of prayer. And there's also many, many other um, prophetic narrations on the importance of Surah Fatiha as well. Um, one thing I wanted to share about it is um, this um, narration from uh, from Sahih Muslim, in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, like, we, we get, we understand the Surah Fatiha to be a conversation between us and Allah. So Allah says that I've divided the prayer between myself and my servant equally and my servant shall be granted what he asked for. Therefore, when the servant says, um, the so when we say the first verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah says, my servant has praised me. And when he says, ar rahman Rahim, Allah says, my servant has extolled me. When he says, Maliki Yawm deen Allah says, my servant has glorified me. When he says, So you alone we worship and your aid do we seek. Allah in turn says, this is between me and my servant and my servant shall have what he requested. And this is how Surah Fatiha is a conversation between Allah and us. It's, a, it's something, it's a, a, this, uh, it shows us like a dialogue between us and Allah because the whole of prayer is actually we are speaking to Allah, we are in the presence of Allah. So it's something that we should, um, you know, th this is why there's all these, um, you know, conditions as well that we just discussed last week of being in that state of purity and not being distracted and all these different things. Um, but Surah Fatih is very significant. So with anything, um, so if you're if you're completely new to, um, you know, learning um, the Quran and, you know, all these things are completely new to you, um, one of the first places that you you can start is Surah Fatiha because once you know Surah Fatiha in every rakat you will have you will be praying Surah Fatiha um, so you know that's something that can um, be very very and, and, and also in every prayer so in every prayer and in every rakat you'll be praying Surah Fatiha so knowing Surah Fatiha will be extremely helpful to you and initially um, there's also um, this uh, you know if you cannot um, I will actually address that in the in the Sunnah part as well as well. Yeah. Oh no, it's it's here. So the, if you cannot recite properly, then this is something that um is if one cannot recite uh, Surah Fatiha or, or other portions of the Quran, he should recite at least seven verses of a similar meaning from the Quran. Um, but if you cannot learn any part of the Quran, so if you're not able to because of poor memory or you're not, you know, it's, you're you're unable to at the moment or foreign language, uh, you could say that this be Subhanallah, Tamheed, Alhamdulillah. So it doesn't mean that if you're not able to recite Surah Fatiha or you're not able to recite the Quran that you um, then, you know, don't, do not um, make it, you do not try to pray. Instead of reciting Surah Fatiha or parts of the Quran, you can say uh, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah. So you can do other sorts of remembrance. And there's this um, narration, the best remembrance after the speech of Allah. So as the speech of Allah is the Quran, is subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, and Allahu Akbar. Uh, and this is um, narrated by a companion. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, also he said, if you have something from the Quran, recite it. If not, then the tamheed, the takbir, and tahleel, say those things, and then bow. So that's um, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. So we have um, that, uh, and so reciting Surah Fatiha is part of the obligatory as well. Um, and then bowing. So this is um, you often you might hear this referred to as um, uh, you know ruku as well. Um, I, I I think I did use ruku in certain parts, certain slides, and then bowing in certain. Um, but essentially, it's um, ruku is when your back um, when you in this position, as you can see the person and the, on the right hand side of the screen, um, when your hands are on your knees and your um, bending down and your back is completely uh, straight and the, there's a verse from the Quran that all those who believe bow down in ruku and bow down in sajda and worship your Lord and do good so that you achieve success so bowing is an essential component uh, obligatory part of prayer and then also standing straight after bowing 
So once you, so from this position, from this bowing position, you will stand straight up. So this is an, a compulsory part of prayer as well, um, that you will stand straight. Um, and there's a narration um, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that he would raise his head from his bowing and then straight until all of his backbones returned to their places. So the companions did tell us how the Prophet, peace be upon him, would pray. Um, and this is something that essentially the, uh, when you stand straight after bowing, I mean, it also indicates that you're not, um, you know, if, if someone doesn't stand straight after bowing and they go straight down into prostration. So let's say they forget to stand straight and they go straight down to prostration or they just quickly come up and they don't like fully because it says straight in, until all of his backbones return to their places. So what this means uh, as well, uh, scholars comment on this is that is that if there's this um, calmness in your prayer. It's not as it's not like you are rushing it and you are you know skipping things and you are wanting to quickly finish it. There's this calmness and this relaxed state that you are in once you're once you're praying. Um, and then after this uh, prostration and then the calmness as well that's, that's mentioned in this narration as well. Um, and then there's actually this. Um, and there's actually this incident um, that um, once the Abu Huraira, um, peace be, uh, you know, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, he narrates this, that once the Prophet, he entered the mosque and a man came in and he said the prayer and then he greeted the Prophet. And the Prophet, he returned his greeting and he said to him, go back and pray again for you not, have not prayed. The man, he then goes and prays again and he comes back and he greets the Prophet. And then the Prophet says to him that, Go back and pray again for you have not prayed. And then the man says, um, by him who has sent you with the truth, I do not know a better way of praying. Kindly teach me how to pray. And this is when the prophet, he says, when you stand for prayer, say takbir, so Allahu Akbar, you know, and then recite from the Quran what you know, and then bow with calmness till you feel at ease and rise from bowing till you stand straight. Afterwards, prostrate calmly till you feel at ease and then raise your head and sit with calmness till you feel at ease. And then prostrate with calmness till you feel at ease in, in prostration because we have two uh, prostrations, we have two sujood that we do, and do the same in the whole of your prayer. So in this we have we see the obl obligation, the compulsory of uh, prostration and also calmness and how important it is that you do this. And this is the Prophet peace be upon him said to him, "You've not com you know you've not completed your prayer." And he kept sending him back to complete his prayer. And when he told him how to pray, he said this in each and every part, you know, until you feel at ease, until you feel at ease. So this is something very. Uh, very very important um, and I think this is something once um, which is which is something we can all um, you know we can all take into account and all we can all improve on is how um, peaceful and relaxed and at ease we feel in prayer um, this is another reason why certain things uh, as we were discussing last week um, are disliked in prayer for instance you know praying when you need when you need to answer the call of nature because you're not at ease you can't be at ease when you're in that situation um, so in all these conditions and all these things they are there for you to be ready to pray um, in a very relaxed and peaceful state um, so this is the, um, uh, the prostration was an obligation and also what bodily parts touch the ground during prostration so the prophet peace upon him he said i have been ordered to prostrate on seven bodily parts the forehead and then he pointed to his nose the hands the knees and the ends of his feet so if we see this little picture on the left the forehead and the nose are one bodily part and then, then your left and your right hand is two and three. The left knee and the right knee is four and five. And then the ends of both your feet are six and seven. And we can see in this little picture um, that the person that has a tick next to him, he's placing his nose and his forehead on the floor. Whereas the person with a cross next to him, he's only placing his forehead. He's not placing his nose on the floor. So this is also about how how pro how you know calmly and settled you do your prostration and all of these parts should be touching the floor um and then the final sitting this is something that's um, obligatory as well when you sit finally at the end um so inshallah now we'll begin with the sunnah sunnahs of prayer and this is um let's inshallah get started so raising the hands so we were discussing how um uh, in the other one, so in the, in the obligatory part, we said takbir, so like saying, you know, Allahu Akbar is um, compulsory. Now, raising the hands while saying it is sunnah. So um, there will be these sort of distinctions that you will feel because 
it will sound as if in certain parts I am repeating certain things that oh but then you will like or even images will be repeated um but it's there's certain parts that are compulsory and then there's certain parts that are um sunnah and that you know the prophet peace upon him would do so raising the hands um and th this is something that um the prophet peace upon him he, was, he would raise his hands um when he would make the takbir so when he would say allah Akbar, he would raise his hands and they would be parallel to his shoulders or close to it um, and there's also um, an opinion that you know the thumbs would be close to or they would, they would be close to the ears so um the scholars say that you know the lower part of your hand would be parallel to your shoulder and then your thumbs would be close to your ears um and then there's this um the there's also an an, an opinion on when to raise your hands so imam abu hanifa and imam Mal malik they say that um the prophet peace be upon him would raise his hand at the beginning of prayer and then he would not do it, do that again. So he would not raise his hands again. Whereas Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmed, uh, they say that they would, he would raise his hands at the beginning of prayer before before going down into um, ruku, um, after coming up from ruku, um, and also after finishing the first the shahud. So when uh, that that is the the opinion of Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmed, um, and you may have noticed this as well that when you go to the masjid and you're praying, that certain people are certain, doing certain actions at certain times, whereas other people don't. Um, but this isn't something which is, uh, there is a difference of opinion on as well. And it's not something which, you know, makes anyone's prayer better than the others or anything like that. This is something that Sister Sabah covered um, in one of the earlier sessions about the difference of opinion about things as well. Um, another point is how is where and um, how to like place your hands. So um, the narration um, is that the, the people were ordered to place the right hand on the left forearm in Salah. So you would place your right hand over your left in prayer. And um, there's uh, also a difference of opinion of um, where you would place your hands. So the, the, the Imam Abu Hanifa, he says, you place for, uh, below the navel. And Imam Shafi, he says, place below the chest. Um, and the there's certain scholars say it's, it's somewhere in the in the middle um so there's different opinion on this as well and then one of the reasons i mentioned these different opinion as well is because when you go to the masjid um or when you see other people praying if someone is praying differently to you it doesn't mean that they're not praying correctly or that their prayer is invalid it just it, it literally is that there is difference of opinion on it and they are they are following another opinion according you know you can always ask them actually as well it'd probably be interesting to find out as well you can you can ask them but um obviously in a respectful and you know more of like a curious tone um uh so no one you know feels threatened or anything like that um and then there's the uh, opening supplication so when you raise your hands um and you you know you've raised your hand you've placed them and you put your right hand on your left um then you have the opening supplication so, so the first thing you would pray um, after starting your prayer, is Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa barakasmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha gayruk. Um, so you are glorified, O Allah, and praised. Your name is blessed. Your majesty is exalted. Nothing has a right to be worshipped but you. And this is uh, a very uh, sort of short prayer. There's another longer one as well that people narrate and that I was prayed that I will mention in the next slide. Um, but this is, this is something that you can... Um, uh, and the reason I mentioned this one first because it's the most commonly known one as well and it's a more shorter one as well. Uh, there's this other one which is narrated by Abu Huraira. Um, may Allah be pleased with him that oh Allah set me apart from my sins as the east and, where, east and west are set apart from each other and clean me from sins as a white garment is cleaned of dirt after thorough washing. Oh Allah wash my sins with water, snow and hail. So both of these laws are, you know, beautiful prayers, the beautiful meaning. Um, and you can pray either one, you know. And there's, you will see as you go into more and more research, there will be more prayers and more options as well that you can do. So this is just two that I've mentioned here. So this is what you would pray as you've placed your hands on your chest and the prayer has started. After that, um, so after, so let's say you, you pray this prayer. You would then pray Surah Fatiha. So as I said, in every prayer, you, or every raka, you pray Surah Fatiha. Um, and then another sunnah is saying ameen so we know often in the masjid as well people or in, if, you're, if you're in a jama'a when the imam he says he recites surah fatiha and he says ameen then you know everyone else says ameen in chorus 
and it's it's a very beautiful sort of like you know a sound like everyone says um I mean like you hear it all together it's very nice um and the prophet peace be upon him actually he, uh, there's the narration about this as well that when the reciter says I mean so when the imam or whoever's leading the prayer they say I mean that then the people who are leading behind him who are praying behind him they should say I mean but if a person's I mean coincides with the I mean of the angels his previous sins will be forgiven so there's a huge huge blessing for saying I mean um, after you know the recitation of surah fatiha um, and then now this is a sunnah in prayer um, reciting you know a, some a part uh, some parts of the quran after surah fatiha and um, this is narrated by abu batada may allah be pleased with him that the prophet peace upon him he used to recite surah fatiha and some surah in each of the first two rakats um, and only surah fatiha in the third and fourth um, and sometimes in the first rakat he would recite a lengthy portion um, and this is um, often so the Quranic recitation after al fatiha it's in the first two rakats not in the third and fourth so let's say if you're praying zuhr salah so there's four rakats in zuhr um, you would pray surah fatiha in the in all of the rakats but only in the first two would you recite some surah, some part of the Quran um, after Surah Fatiha, not in the third and fourth. Um, and this is something um, about the Prophet, peace be upon him, about him prolonging the recitation in the first rakah. Um, they he would he is actually recommended to prolong in the in the Fajr prayer. So the Imam, the person who's leading the Fajr prayer, uh, to to prolong his recitation in the Fajr prayer, because the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the, is narrated that he would continue to prolong his recitation until he he would hear no more footsteps um, you know, of the people coming to catch the prayer. Um, so he, he would want everyone to have joined and everyone to be um, part of the Fajr prayer. And then that's why he would prolong the recitation in the first rakah. Um, um, and this is, he made the morning prayer the longest of his obligatory prayers because the, the recitation is also witnessed by Allah and the angels. Um, so because it's a, it's a time that is um, the angels who record the daytime deeds, um, the daytime deeds that they are switching over. So this is also another another reason for making the recitation longer in Fajr Salah. Um, so in this Quranic recitation after Al-Fatiha, um, you know, there's difference in opinion of how much you need to recite um, for, you know, it to be a Quranic recitation. But, um, you know, uh, what some of the scholars, they say are three verses. So it doesn't need to be a huge amount of the Quran that you recite, but something that, uh, you know, is, is a substantial, you know, it, 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 you can tell, like you can see it's a substantial amount. Um, that is fine. And then after this, you can, um, you know, after when you've recited sort of um, Fatiha and then a Surah, then you would go down into a Ruku. Um, so this Sunnah, making Takbir position to position. So this means that, so when we, go down from ruku into sujood we would say allah Akbar. when we come up from sujood and we are sitting down in the middle of the two prostrations we say allah Akbar. when we go down to the next one we say allah Akbar. so you will often hear um even if it's a completely if it's a silent prayer so zohar and asr when you pray in congregation you know they are silent prayers there is no uh, recitation done in them out, out loud um, but you will also, or you will always hear the Imam say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, because you will be um, from one position to another. That is the um, what you say when you make the fear moving from one position to another. And the only the only time you say something different is when you stand up from uh, ruku, so from bowing when you stand up. So when you know when you put your hands on your knees and your back is straight from that position when you stand up. That is the only time you will say something different and you will not say Allah, but instead you will say Sami Allah, uh, Sami Allah, Rabbana Lakal Ham. So Allah, He is the one who praises Him. Our Lord to you be the praise. Um, and there's also narrated that yeah, the, pro the Prophet, peace be upon him, he would make the be upon every luring, rising, standing, and sitting. So this is something which is uh, a sunnah in prayer. And it's, um, you know, we often, we always hear this in the masjid as well. Um, and there's, uh, the manner of bowing. So this is, we mentioned how um, ruku and bowing was an obligatory part of prayer. Now the manner of it, how you do it, is where the sunnah and the the, the way that Prophet Peter would, would do it comes in. So when you're actually in ruku, um, you should say, Subhanallah Rabbi al-Azim, 
so this is a prayer, how perfect my Lord is, the Supreme, subhanahu wa And this is the prayer that you should say in Ruku. Um, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, he, when he would bow down, he would be straight, his head would be neither up nor down, um, and he would place his hands on his knees as he was holding them. So it's something, it's a very um, straight and um, uh, steady position that he would be in. Um, and this is the, and then that's the sunnah of man of boring, the, then the man of prostrating. Uh, this is another sunnah in which how, how would you prostrate? Um, and this is when um, all the parts that we mentioned should be on the 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 floor, um, the seven parts, um, and also the the um, the wording that was used in the hadith, the 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 calmness that should be there in the prostration as well. Um, and then in prostration, whilst you're prostration, you should say Subhanahu bil Atla, which means how perfect is my Lord, the Most High. Um, and actually, when we are in prostration, when we are in sujood on the floor in that position, the Prophet peace be upon him said that you are the closest one of you comes to his Lord is while he's prostrating. So we are in the closest position to Allah when we are in our prostration. Therefore, make as many supplications in it. So you should make as many prayers that you can in prostration. And he has also said, I have prohibited, I have prohibited you from reciting while bowing or prostrating. So we actually don't recite Quran, the Quran or any part of the Quran whilst we are bowing down or whilst we are in prostration. Um, and in, in prostration, we should try to make as many as, and as many supplications as we can. Um, and you should uh, try as hard uh, to you know think of what prayers and what supplications you want to make in that time. So that's um, prostration and what you say in prostration. Now, sitting between prostrations and making a supplication. So between both of the prostrations in the middle of it to sit um, and also to make a supplication at that time is reported from the Prophet, peace upon him, and he used to do that. And he would say, Allahumma frilli wa hamni wa afini wa ahdini wa zukni. Oh Allah, uh, forgive me and have mercy on me and save me from all bad. Guide me and provide for me everything beneficial. So this is also um, a sunnah between sitting between the prostrations and making uh, a supplication. Um, and then there's also in all of these parts where I'm saying about supplications and prayers, um, there will be different prayers that people make. It's not only a certain set prayer. Um, uh, in, for instance, in, in ruku and sujood, the subhanahu wa ta'ala deem and subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that, you know, uh, across the board people do and then they make other prayers along with it. But for instance, in this, um, in sitting between the prostrations, there, there will be other prayers as well that you can make um, instead of this one, for instance. Um, and then sitting on breast. So this refers to um, sitting down between your first and second raka, and then your third and fourth raka, because um, the actual sitting of the shahud or the sitting that you do at the end of prayer, that comes after Two, after two rakahs, you sit um, for a short period of time. If it's, if it's a four rakah prayer, you will sit after two rakahs for a short period of time, and then you will sit after all the four are complete for a longer period of time. But if, but if it's um, the first and the third, just a sitting of rest before you get up again. And um, this is what's mentioned in, in this as well. Um, and then the sitting for the shahwad. Uh, so this is right at the end when you sit um, and um, it's the you would put your you with your thumb and your middle finger, you you make like a circle. I think um, maybe not. Um, let me find like a picture of it. I uh, if I can. So I might. So there you can see the person when he's this is the shot of the final sitting. So how you raise his finger and you make that circle, because I don't think I could explain that as clearly as the image can. So this is the, this is the shot of the final sitting. Um, and let me get back to the slide. Yeah. And um, it's also um, reported the Prophet piece of one who would point with his index finger. And we know there's a different opinion on this. Some people, they um, move their index finger and some people, uh, they point, they raise it and then they put it back down when they say, I should Allah, I should Allah. In the, the shahud. And then what you actually say in the shahud whilst you're sitting down um, is this is narrated from Bukhari and Muslim. So um, 
في إت أتيات لله والصلوات والطيبات والسلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين أشهد الله إله إلا الله. So this is where you would raise your finger or you would uh, be moving it on depending on the different opinions. أشهد الله إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. So this is what you say when you sit down after. So if you're praying two rakats, you would say this. And then you would recite um, salutations and the Prophet peace be upon him, and then recite a prayer. Uh, but if you're praying four, then you would say this: Muhammad and and then you would stand back up for your third and fourth rakat. So if you, um, this is something which is um, uh, is the first thing that's said when you're when you're sitting down in the shahud. and then the next thing is um, the prayers upon the Prophet peace be upon him. Um, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, they were asked that how uh, he, the, the companions asked him that how do we how do we make how do we say uh, you know prayers upon you? Um, and then he said that you know say oh Allah shall bless him upon Muhammad upon the family of Muhammad as you shall bless him upon the family of Ibrahim. So this is the translation of this. So uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa, wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim. وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. So in your sitting, so let's imagine you're in your fourth rakah. So this is your final sitting that you're doing. The first thing you would recite when you sit down is this, is this dua here. التيات الله والصلوات. Once you recited this. Um, and then you've passed Ashhadu Alla Ilaha Illallah, Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Abdul Rasulu, and the end of this prayer. Then you would go on to recite this. So this is called salutations on the Prophet peace be upon him. And then after this, um, because this is your final sitting, um, you would um, you would also make some sort of dua after the the salutations. Um, and there's different, there's many, many different supplications that you can make at this time. And it, one example is this one: Allah min yaud bika min adha bil qabr, wa min adha bi jahannam, wa min fitnat al mahiya wa mat, wa min shari fitnat al masih al dajjal. So Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave, from the punishment of hellfire, from the trials of life and death, and from the evil, the trial of the false messiah. So you would first do the, just to repeat that again. So when you are sitting, you would first do this. Dua at Tayyati Allahi wa Salawat. Then you would do this Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad um, and send salutations on the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then you would do any other supplication, another dua. So, an example of another dua is this one, and there's many other ones as well um, that you can find in the Sunnah. Um, so, another example is this one Allahumma is lam tunafsi ذُلْمًا كَثِيرًا وَلَا يَفْرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْ فَقْفِرْ لِي مَغْفِرَةً مِنْ إِنْدِكَ وَأَرْحَمْنِي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ So Allah, O oh Allah, I have wronged myself greatly and nobody forgives sins except you. Grant me forgiveness and have mercy on me. Surely you are the forgiver and the merciful. So there's a different, you know, options and duas that you can, supplications you can make at this time. And then, then you would say, after a dua, you would then say salam. You would, send, you would then turn your head to the right, so 90 degrees to the right, and say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Then turn your head to the left and say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And that would be the end of your prayer. Um, now, in the next slide is another sunnah that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would do. And this is after prayer. So, this is after your prayer has finished. Um, then the Prophet, peace be upon him, he would say, um, he would make a dua then as well. So, there's different duas that the Prophet, peace upon him, would would do. So, there's different zikrs as well. So, this is um, that he would do like the remembrance of Allah after prayer. Um, so, this is the sunnah of prayer. But before I go into questions, um, I wanted to um, actually go through, um, I'm going to try to do this. Um, so I did this with, um, so if I do it like, let me just go to this one. So what I wanted to do is, so as we, we've, we've gone through the obligatory and the sunnah acts of salah, and what I wanted to now do is talk us through praying to rakah of prayer. Um, and I want, you know, say, 
you know each and every the one each and everything um but just to you just to talk us through it and just to you know familiarize ourselves with it so we will for this example we'll just do let's imagine we're doing two rakat of fajr a fajr prayer yeah you're praying at home you're ready you've got your wudu you've got your you know hijab everything on and you're ready to pray um the first thing you would do is make your intention which we discussed earlier on that you know, that's something important. You just make it in your mind. You, you know that you're praying fajr, you're praying two raga, the two couples raga of fajr prayer. And then you would say takbir, you would raise your hands and you would say Allahu Akbar. Um, and then here you would say that dua that we discussed in the before in the slide was Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. You would say that dua and then you would recite Surah Fatiha. And then you would recite any other surah from the Quran because this is fajr prayer. So you would recite, you would recite any other surah from the Quran. Um, and then, so you would be in this position whilst doing all of those three things, saying the dua, saying surah fatiha, and then reciting a surah. And then you would go down into ruku. So in ruku, you would say subhanahu wa azim, subhanahu wa azim, uh, subhanahu wa azim. And then you would stand straight up after ruku and you would say, Sami Allah, Yuman Hamida, Rabbana wa hamd. And then you would go down into sujood. Um, so after standing straight up from ruku, um, and saying the dua, you would go down into sujood, into prostration, and in prostration you would say Subhanahu wa Taala, Subhanahu wa Subhanahu wa And you can then after this you can sit up, um, uh, because there's two sujood, there's two prostrations in every single rakat. So you will sit up, um, and then then you will you will say the dua in the middle of the prostration that we did as well, and then you will go back down into prostration. Um, and after, once you've prostrated and you've said subhanAllah, uh, then you would stand up again because this is one rakah complete. Yeah, when you stand up again into standing, that is one rakah of, you know, now example of fajr, which has been completed. Then you would start again with surah fatiha. So you would be standing again. And this, is now, this is now your second rakah of fajr. Uh, so you would be um, uh, standing and you would um, recite Surah Fatiha, then you would recite a Surah, um, and then you would go down into Ruku, and in this bowing position, this is now the second Raka, um, and then you would repeat everything that you did before, you would stand up again, then from the standing position you would go down into your prostration, um, and then from prostration you would sit up again, um, pray the Dua in the middle, go back down again, and then after this, you would actually stay sitting like this in your tashahud position. Because now you're in the second rakah of fajr, which you will now just, you will stay sitting and you will complete your prayer now. So in this, initially you will pray as we were saying, attayatu. you will pray that dua in the beginning. And then you will send salutation, the Prophet peace be upon him, which is Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, um, and that dua. And then you will make some sort of supplication. Um, from after that, and then you will say salam. So to the to your right and to your left, you will say salam. So this is an example of two rakat of, uh, you know, for example, fajr. Um, now, if I was to give you an example from a four four rakat prayer, uh, so let's take asr for instance. Um, asr um, is something uh, so. So we will start again. Um, so you're you're ready to pray. Your asr, your asr prayer. The time is coming and everything. Um, so the first thing you would do is you would raise your hands and you would do everything the same until everything the same. So I'm not going to repeat exactly everything. Um, you will do everything the same until this. So for the second rakat, you will sit after your prostration, but you will only sit until. Um, illallah, until you know you raise your finger that is the only time you will sit until and then you will actually stand up again because it's a four rakat prayer so you will go to the standing position again and then you will you will, you will do an, another two more rakat and then you will sit again into the long sitting position of uh, the shahud um, the salutations, the dua and then the salam so this is the only difference between a, a two rakah and a, a four rakah prayer. Inshallah, I'll end the session there. Is there anything else, um, Sister Saba, you would like to add to this? Let me just go to the questions as well.
So if you have any um, questions in chat, you can ask those as well. Um, and oh, um, there's a question here um, by 